11.58 p.m. December 31st, just outside Moscow. A New Year's gift worth less than $10,000 cheaper than a used pickup truck is crashing into a multi-billion dollar power grid. In exactly 120 seconds, those three substations feeding the heart of Russia's logistics hub will face a catastrophic energy disruption Moscow has seen in decades. This is the bill. Hours earlier, Russian strikes went after Ukraine's power network around Kiev. So Ukraine responded. No speeches, no warnings, just a simple message written in physics and fire. If you hit our grid, your grid is no longer off limits. Take a look at this map. You see all those red arrows, dozens of them coming from the southeast, the northwest, the south, all converging on Moscow like a Category 5 hurricane. Those aren't just lines on a screen, those are the flight paths of 40 UJ-26 beavers on New Year's Eve. Long before the midnight countdown even started in Moscow, these birds were rolling off secret tarmacs deep inside Ukraine. This wasn't just a swing for the fences, it was an all-out multi-directional ambush. Look at the spread drones launched from regions like Bryansk, Smolensk, and Kursk. By surrounding the capital from every angle, Ukraine created a tactical nightmare, forcing the Russian air defense to scatter its focus and look in 10 places at once. The strategy was a two-wave chess move. Ukraine sent out a sacrificial squad, eight decoy drones flying at a medium altitude, practically screaming, look at me to every radar operator in the sector. Meanwhile, the real heavy hitters, the other 32 beavers, were hugging the deck. We're talking extreme low-altitude flight ghosting along the Oka River Valley and using the Thung Valleys to stay invisible. They were using the terrain like a seasoned linebacker using his blockers to slip past the line of scrimmage without being touched. The Beaver itself is a long-range beast. It's an aircraft-type UAV that can travel over 600 miles carrying a 165-pound payload of high-explosive frag and an incendiary mix. That incendiary part is the secret sauce. It's specifically engineered to punch through a heavy steel transformer tank and turn the thousands of gallons of cooling oil inside into a significant thermal event that's nearly impossible to extinguish. And for the tech geeks in the room, these things don't just rely on GPS. They use DSMNC digital scene matching. Think of it like a digital navigator that looks out the window and compares the ground features to satellite maps saved in its brain. It doesn't care if the Russians are jamming the GPS signals into oblivion. It knows exactly where it is by looking at the landmarks. The targets were the 500 to 750 kilovolt substations at Romenskoye, Zhukovsky, and Litkarino. These are the high voltage arteries that pump gigawatts into the heart of Russia's logistics and industrial engine. Now look back at those arrows on the map. To the guys in the Kremlin, it probably looked like a massive, sophisticated missile ring. However, the irony is that it only took a few dozen smart drones to bring the whole system to its knees. Ukraine's real genius was forcing the Russians to trip over their own feet. To get those 32 main drones through, they needed the Russians to turn their electronic warfare systems, the Krasuka-4, up to full power way too early. When a monster like the Krasuka-4 screams at maximum volume, it creates electronic fratricide. It's so loud that the nearby Russian Panzer radars go completely blind, unable to tell a low-flying drone apart from the clutter of the ground. Ukraine didn't just sneak through the door, they tricked the Russians into slamming that door so hard they broke the hinges off. If you were sitting in that command chair, would you have the guts to sacrifice eight of your drones just to bait the enemy into blinding themselves? Drop a comment below and let me know your call. I'll be pinning the most tactical answer I see. 8.15 p.m. Moscow Standard Time. The radar operators at the Bryansk sector didn't just see a blip, they saw a full-blown invasion. Eight Beaver drones, high-end aircraft worth nearly a million dollars combined, were flying in a tight formation at 2,000 feet. They weren't hiding. They were showing off their radar signatures like a neon sign in a dark alley. Inside the Panzer S-1 battery, the fire control computer let out a continuous high-pitched scream as it locked onto all eight targets. The commander didn't hesitate. Free fire! The night sky over the Moscow outskirts turned from black to a violent strobing orange. The Panzer S-1's dual 30mm autocannons began to bark cycling at 5,000 rounds per minute. It's a sound that vibrates in your chest, a mechanical roar that shreds the air. Every fifth round was a tracer, creating literal ribbons of fire reaching up into the clouds. Then came the missiles. 
The 57E6 interceptors left the rails with a crack like a whip accelerating to Mach 2 in a heartbeat. Impact! The first Beaver was neutralized in a massive, significant thermal event 3,000 feet up. A split second later, the second and third followed. To the people in the suburbs below, it looked like the ultimate New Year's fireworks display. These were 165-pound warheads and high-grade aviation fuel vaporizing in the cold night air. The shockwaves were rattling the windows of the dacha houses for miles around. Inside the Russian command center, it was pure adrenaline. Operators were shouting over the roar of the sirens. Target 4 destroyed! Target 5 neutralized! It was a surgical execution of a high-end swarm. The Russian officers were probably slapping each other on the back, feeling like they'd just pitched a no-hitter in the World Series. They were looking at the wreckage falling from the sky. High-tech Ukrainian engineering turned into a rain of burning carbon fiber, and they thought they'd won. To seal the deal, they went for the overkill. The order was given to the Krasuka 4 crews, flood the zone. Give me everything you've got. The Krasuka 4 is a beast. It creates a wall of electronic white noise so thick that nothing, no GPS, no radio, no cell signal can survive it. But here's the thing about a scream that loud. It makes everyone else in the room deaf too. The Russian commanders thought they were slamming the door shut. In reality, that massive EW output was causing electronic fratricide. Their own Panzer radar started to fuzz out blinded by the whiteout coming from their own jammers. It was the perfect moment of tactical irony. While the Russians were busy high-fiving over the destruction of eight beavers, they had just created a massive silent blind spot. It was like a quarterback throwing a deep bomb into double coverage, only for the defense to realize too late it was a trick play and the real runners were already slipping through the side gates while everyone was looking up at the sky. The party in the bunker was just getting started, but the lights were about to go out. This is it, the championship drive, the moment where the math of war meets the cold reality of physics. While the Russian commanders in the Bryansk sector were still high-fiving over those eight decoys, the real swarm, the 32 heavy hitters, were already crossing the final red zone. These weren't coming from just one direction anymore. Remember that drone bomber telegram map? Those red arrows were now a reality. They were converging on Moscow from the southeast, the west, and the south using a multi-axis ambush that would make a Navy SEAL team look like amateurs. 11.45 p.m. The first realization hit the Russian general staff like a bucket of ice water. A junior radar technician at a long-range S-400 Triumph battery noticed something wrong. His screen was a mess of snow thanks to the Krasuka 4 jammers they turned up to full power, but through the white noise he saw intermittent flickers. Little ghosts dancing just 50 feet above the Oka River. The S-400 is the big stick, a billion-dollar system designed to swat planes out of the sky from 250 miles away. But physics is a cruel mistress. At 50 feet, the curvature of the Earth acts like a solid wall. The drones were effectively under the floor of the radar's vision. Every time the S-400 tried to establish a track lock, the beaver would dip behind a tree line or a riverbank and the lock would shatter. Target lost reacquiring, give me a lock! The operator screamed, his hands sweating over the joystick. But don't think for a second that the Russians were just sitting there. They are professionals and they were fighting back with everything the Kremlin ever paid for. An S-400 operator finally caught a flicker of beaver drone that had to climb just 20 feet to clear a radio tower. Lock fire! A 48N6 missile, a two-ton beast designed to vaporize supersonic jets, roared off the rail. It was like using a sledgehammer to swat a mosquito, but the math worked. The missile's proximity fuse triggered, and the beaver was neutralized in a massive, significant thermal event that lit up the clouds for five miles. One down. Seconds later, a second beaver was caught in a cross-sectional radar sweep and met the same fate. The sky was filled with the falling, glowing debris of high-end Ukrainian carbon fiber. By the time the command reached the Buke M3 and Tor M2 medium-range systems closer to the city, the chaos was total. These crews were frantically trying to boot up their fire control radars, but they were fighting a war in a fog of their own making. The Krasuka 4 was still screaming at 100% volume, causing electronic fratricide. The book's radar was trying to listen for a whisper while its own neighbor was shouting through a megaphone right next to it. One Tor M2 crew realized their radar was useless and flipped over to their optical thermal trackers. They spotted the heat signature of a beaver's engine ghosting over a tree line. Manual track launch. 
the Tor missile corkscrewed through the night guided by a TV camera and impacted the drone's wing. The Beaver spun wildly before impacting a vacant field in a secondary significant thermal event. Got another one target neutralized, they cheered. Then came the Panzer S1s, the last line of defense. And here is where the reload cycle trap snapped shut like a steel jaw. Most of the Panzer units near the suburbs had just spent their 12 missile magazines on those eight decoys earlier. In a lab, a reload takes a few minutes. In the middle of a New Year's Eve blizzard with adrenaline-soaked hands and freezing metal that literally tears the skin off your palms, it's a 15 to 20 minute manual nightmare. The Russian crews were out in the cold breath, visible in the freezing air, desperately winching new 125-pound missiles onto the rails. You could hear the frantic clanking of the metal loaders and the screaming of NCOs, faster get them on the rails! One Panzer crew managed to get exactly two missiles loaded just as three beavers cleared the final ridge. They didn't wait for a full load. They fired, impact. One beaver vaporized, but the other two were already inside the minimum engagement zone too close for missiles. The crew slammed the switch to the dual 30 millimeter autocannons. The roar was deafening a wall of lead pumping out at 80 rounds per second. They shredded one beaver at point blank range so close that the burning debris actually peppered the Panzer's own radar dish. But even as the Russians neutralized drone after drone, six, seven, eight birds falling in flames, the math was moving against them. For every beaver they swatted down, three more were slipping through the gaps they'd created in their own blind spots. The Russian defense was firing everything they had, depleting their magazines and overheating their barrels, but the wolves were already in the yard and the primary targets were now dead ahead. 11.55 p.m. The swarm hit the outer perimeter of Ramenskoye, Zhukovsky, and lit Karino. The Russian defense went into a scrunched panic. Every available asset, from heavy SAMs to guys on roofs with shoulder-fired Iglis, started blind firing into the darkness. The sky was a crisscross of tracers and SAM plumes. It looked like a sci-fi movie, but the targets weren't cooperating. The beavers weren't just flying in a straight line. Their DSMNC computers were executing subtle jinx comparing the ground below to satellite imagery with surgical precision. One Panzer crew managed to get a manual optical lock. The commander squeezed the trigger and the dual 30 mm cannons roared to life tracers chewing through the air. A beaver caught a burst and disintegrated in a significant thermal event just 500 yards from a transformer bank. The Russian crew cheered for exactly three seconds because right behind that drone were three more, and they were using the first one's debris as a screen. 11.58 p.m. The lead beaver at the Ramenskoye substation locked its DSMNC eye onto the primary 750 kV transformer tank. These things are the size of a two-story house filled with thousands of gallons of specialized, highly flammable cooling oil. Impact. The 165-pound HE frag warhead didn't just explode, it performed a kinetic execution. The fragmentation sleeve shredded the steel casing and the incendiary mix ignited the pressurized oil instantly. A massive, brilliant orange mushroom cloud erupted into the night sky, dwarfing the New Year's fireworks. This wasn't just a fire. It was a cascading system failure. As the Ramenskoye transformer turned into a significant thermal event, the surge of energy tried to find somewhere to go. It raced down the lines, hitting the Zhukovsky and lit Carino substations. Just as those systems were trying to compensate, the rest of the beaver swarm arrived. Multiple impacts, one after another. Inside the Russian grid control center, the status green lights on the giant wall map started turning a violent strobing red. One sector went dark, then three, then ten. The automated safety breakers were tripping so fast they sounded like machine gun fire. Shut down emergency. Shut down of sector four. We're losing the load balance. In their panic to save the rest of the grid from a total meltdown, the Russian operators did exactly what Ukraine hoped they would. They started manually pulling the plugs. They cut power to entire industrial districts to prevent the fire from spreading through the wires. By 001 AM, as the rest of the world was singing and cheering, a massive shadow fell over the heart of Russia's logistics hub. The lights didn't just flicker, they died. The significant thermal events at the three main substations were so intense they could be seen from the center of Moscow, glowing like a second angry sun on the horizon. 
Ukraine had achieved the impossible. They had used Russia's own jammers to blind their eyes, Russia's own reload cycles to tie their hands, and Russia's own grid safety protocols to expand the blackout. It was a masterclass in strategic destruction. 32 drones worth maybe $3 million total had just caused a billion dollars in infrastructure damage and paralyzed the logistical heart of a superpower. So tell me, looking at that map now with the lights out and the smoke rising, who do you think really won the New Year's firework competition? The guys with the expensive Sams or the guys with the $10,000 beavers and a smarter playbook? Make sure you're subscribed because we're about to dive into the long-term strategic nightmare this created for the Kremlin. Glory to the heroes. See you in the next breakdown.